MegaCon Giant, your host, Eric Coffey here. In today's episode, I bring you an environmental scientist. That's right. Lynn Petrozulo of Avanti Corporation out of Virginia has been helping federal government decision makers solve environmental science issues, deal with regulatory and compliance issues, particularly those in energy related sectors. So, for example, when you're looking at decisions that EPA needs to make for folks doing stuff in our oceans and putting in like wind farms, then she's the person that they're doing the analysis, going into the databases and finding out what impacts it has on the environment, making studies and field reports and submitting it to the government. Yeah, I know. It's kind of crazy. So in this episode, we discuss what kind of things has she had to face over the last 35 years of doing this in terms of challenges, especially as political parties change hands, what type of feelings that she has about herself internally uh, in terms of self-doubt and how she overcomes that. And also we go through some of her mentors and some of the uh, parts, places that she's been, some of the organizations that she's joined to help her overcome what it takes to be a Native American woman growing a federal contracting business in this particular industry. So we know already just because of the kind of work that she does, she faces a lot of pushback, I can imagine. And so we discussed that and we want to get into that and more in today's upcoming GovCon Giant episode. So stay tuned. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, Lynn Petrozulo with Avanti Corporation. And by the way, thank you for that because I did not know how to say your last name. I thought it might I I forgot to ask even before we got started. Yeah. So, but and that's most okay. People say Petra, and they just kind of stop. Petra is right. It was where we stopped at. Say it again, Petra Zulo. Petra Zulo. Okay, where's that name from? It's Italian. It's from my husband. Okay, nice, nice, nice. Okay, all <laughs> right. Well, that's okay. Uh, where are you originally from? I am from the D.C. area. I am originally. Where- Dear DC natives, grew up in Hyattsville and moved to Fairfax, went away to college and came back. Ah, where'd you go to college? At UBA. You didn't go far. (laughs) far, But like, I mean, I remembered you going to school in the DMV area. I was like, wait, she moved away. No, in state was the, you know. No. Thing with money. <laughs> no, 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 no. I went in state. I'm a University of Florida grad. I'm from Florida. So I stayed in state. Now they, they yeah. definitely give you more of an incentive when it comes, you know, for the money side. So yes. that makes sense. And now, so you went to UVA and uh, what'd you study? Well, I studied a bunch of things and then ended up <laughs> in my last two years doing an environmental science degree. And, and so now, right, some years later, you're still doing environmental science. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I used my degree. It's crazy. <laughs> right. That's so <laughs> that's you said it, not me, Lynn. <laughs> I was thinking that. I was like, wow, she actually used her degree. Yeah, right? Okay. Well, that's no, that's neat. I, I I think that's great because uh, you know, what I gathered from that is that you knew what you wanted to do early on. Well, yeah, I didn't I think I didn't really know, and then I fell into it. And then it's only been after however many years that I look back and realize, yeah, that was always how I was thinking. And, uh, you know, if I had thought about it before college, I would have saved some time and money. <laughs> well, that's pretty amazing, though, because like you just said, and we both agree, the fact that you were able to use your degree and then build a career out of it. I mean, that's that is so unlike 90 percent of people in this world. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. You know. Yeah. One of those, you know, find your passion discussions. And I realized, you know, this has always been the way I've thought. Yeah, that's what I think of. And I and, uh, you know, when we when we get more into the conversation, you know, I would draw the conclusion that, you know, the people that like are at the top of their games in any industry, they kind of found their passion early on. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a a friend of mine, um, very, very accomplished uh, businesswoman, um, we've asked her, you know, how can you do so many different things? And she says, well, if they all fit into my one main goal, I'm only doing one thing. And that just really, really, right. Just resonated. It's like, oh, wow, that's how you can do all these many, many things. Can I steal that answer? (laughs) <laughs> no, I think so because so people, I give credit to um, Angela Reddick. Give credit Reddick. to Angela Reddick. That's right. What's the name of her company? 
uh Arctix. Okay. All right. Angela read Arctix. Thank you for that. We're gonna use that one. No, but I, I do I actually, you know, identify with that because it's true. People say, How do you do all this stuff? I'm trying to keep up with you. One of my callers this morning, um, who's at a very accomplished roofing company, and he says, I'm just trying to keep up with you. And I'm like, I mean, you're accomplished yourself, right? But you're right. If it falls into our one, uh, the area that we're, you know, we're passionate about, it's, we're really doing one thing. So that makes sense. I like that. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. I like, I like it on the call now. <laughs> I like that. No, that's good. So now tell for the people who do not know you and know your business, can you tell us a little bit about your, your you know, what is your, your business does? Uh, sure. So Avanti Corporation um, provide science and engineering studies for federal regulatory agencies. So, you know, EPA, um, regulating offshore industries, we look at what the impacts are, what the costs are, um, trying to find that balance so that industry can happen, but in an environmentally responsible way, so that, you know, we we don't write the laws, but we write all the, the, the documents, the studies, the um, analyses, the data reports, that then our federal clients use those to make their rules and regulations. Do you have competition? Yes, we do. Okay. No, I mean, <laughs> I would think that that's something that like, no one wants to do that. <laughs> I'm just telling you, Lynn, from my perspective, I'm like, does anybody else really want to do that? What Lynn's doing? very boring. I can get more geeky and, and really go down rabbit holes. So we're going to get, we're going to get geeky because I'm an engineer. So I like to get geeky. Even if the audience wants to be like high surface level stuff, I want to geek out on these things, but well, our, I just, our competition is, is the big companies, the Tetra Tech, AECOM, HDR. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I know AECOMs, but I just know that AECOM, I mean, they just have an umbrella of stuff that they do. Right. So, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, to find someone that's specifically focused on this aspect of it is, is very unique uh, in my opinion. So now give us some examples of studies that you would do for the EPA. Uh, let's see. So something that we're bidding on may or may not be able to do it is um, the most recent project we're proposing is to work with the EPA to create an outreach program and distribution of test kits in the Virgin Islands where people use cisterns for their drinking water. And so they need to know how to properly test and, and take care of this cistern as a public health issue. Now tell for us that don't know what a cistern is, what is a cistern? Uh, so they collect their rainwater. And is that the blue that things that sit on the roofs? Can be, yes. Okay, they, okay, okay. And they use that for drinking water just because they don't have a full infrastructure of drinking water sources like, like mainland. Okay. Okay. And so then they want to, they're doing an outreach to see how to, to test the water. To, to teach people how to test. Oh, the to water. teach them how to test the water. Okay. Right. And actually provide them with the kits. And gotcha. Okay. Properly. There, and there's more than just testing. It's how to maintain it, how to, to just visually clean inspect it or inspect it. Okay. It. Exactly. Exactly. So that would be um, a public outreach program where we would look at how to best reach people. Okay. Uh, you know, what the message might be, create public service announcements, go down mm. and do training programs in um, community centers, uh, markets where we decide is, you know, going to reach the most people. Okay. Uh, so that's one we've been on recently. Another one, a very larger, you know, global, not global, uh, national program would be um, we're working with uh, some of the larger companies. Uh, so they're not just our competitors. We actually team sure, with them. Sure, absolutely, and right. Up with them. Um, so we're on a team to develop a programmatic environmental impact statement for offshore wind in the New York area. So all of these um, companies are coming in and trying to put in wind turbines. Okay. But we have to look at the overall impact of putting all of these different projects in. So we're looking at trying to streamline that um, by doing what's called a programmatic review, we're going to look at multiple projects and look at the impacts and get that documented and get that in place so that when the wind energy companies come to the Department of Interior, they've already assessed 
some of the impacts and can streamline the, the review of each individual project. You know, so I, I, get geeky. <laughs> I, I like that because you are essentially, you are arming the government and decision makers with the ammunition they need to make proper policies and proper decide, make determinations on what direction to go. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. We don't make the law. No, no, of course. You're giving the information. They need to make a decision on whether, whether how they want to handle it. Exactly. Does anything that you do, uh, does anyone ever try to politicize it? Um, yeah. Okay. No, I, I mean, no, I, and, I, and I, I never like to talk about politics, but I just, I just wondered if someone tried to make it seem like as if you're, you know, because people do these reports and studies and sometimes people try to like make it like it was... I don't know, bias um, or something. Yeah, I've had, well, I've, I've had, I've done, I actually did a, a lecture um, at EVA one time okay. on the politics in environmental science. Uh. And, and what happens is when when people get like offshore oil and gas, right. people get passionate about it. Right. You look at it in Louisiana, you're going to need to assess it and do the all of the all of the studies that you need to do and do it all thoroughly and do it right. If okay. you're going to look at it offshore California or North Carolina, the demonstration I had was an EIS for Cal, uh, Louisiana is uh -huh. this. An okay. EIS for North Carolina is, is this. That. You wow. just have to anticipate that there will be much more resistance. Right. So you just have to. It doesn't mean your study is different. It no, just sure. you got to anticipate. You got a bit more support behind it, more, yeah. Okay. Right. That's and fine. and we have, this is an old example from the 1980s where we were um, regulating offshore oil and gas. And it was new. We hadn't really regulated that. Okay. Okay. And we, I was working with three different engineers and a, a lawyer and we were writing up this permit. I was pretty new in my career and we were working at EPA downtown and, you know, knock on the door of our little war room. Um, and it was a letter from the White House. And the president was making his wishes known of what would or might not happen with regulating no. the oil. Riley. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but it all comes out in the end because we wrote the, we wrote the regulation. It went okay. out. It got sued. It got sued by industry and by the environmental groups. So it got sued. Win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody, everybody. everybody sued. So it and it because it being a, a a national regulation, it went before um, a uh, appeals court, circuit appeals court, and we ended up getting all the things we wanted into the permit. We just had to go that extra step to make right. sure that everything we had done was according to the regulations and that the data backed up the numbers that needed to be there. So wow. yeah, it can get political. So and okay. and where the money goes, you know, right. one previous administration, we had to, for example, we had to scrub the entire um, in the EPA website that we maintain a, a certain portion. We had to scrub it of Anywhere that it said climate change, mm. you know, just right silly. things like that. Right, yeah, silly. nice. But, but the work, the people that work at EPA and the people doing the work all really care about what they're doing. So sure. it doesn't change what's happening. It's just we, you know, we have to go with right. Sure, right. No, I actually understand. Let's talk about more exciting side of it. <laughs> I just was curious about that, but uh, you know. Tell me some of, because again, I was on your website kind of perusing and I saw some really like cool things that you had done that I was intrigued by. One in particular where you did a national, uh, the national program chemicals for PCBs, asbestos, and you scan and inventory thousands of documents to create the online records and the rulemaking. I really, you know, because again, I support uh, companies out of the Northeast and we have a lot of asbestos. We have a lot of, you know, hazardous materials handling that we face with so it's it's it was fascinating to me that you actually help inventory these things um to create a searchable database 
Yeah, and that to me was, um, it, it, those are the kinds of projects that we'll do because sometimes the big companies don't want to deal with it. It's it's record keeping. Right, so, right, right. But it get, but I see it as we get in front of the client, we get that relationship established. Um, yeah, they had just yards and yards of paper in filing cabinets. Okay. And and so they would get a, a FOIA request, you know, for right. information sure. act. And they'd have to go rifling through and try and find anything relevant to answer whatever it was. And so we went in and just took every document, inventoried them, created just a simple database that was searchable by keywords. Right. And, you know, set up the keywords with them. What are the, what are the common questions you get? And just thousands of documents um, into a very simple database so you could link up you, you do your search there's the the hyperlink to the document they would spend days on FOIA requests and they were floored like I could do one in three hours oh my right, god right right um, and sometimes it's just dealing with older people who aren't as tech savvy right so, sure you know it's not difficult so then when they saw that they um for the asbestos work they were like wow we could do that for PCBs too. You know? Right, right, right. But someone had to have the foresight to say, we need, we need this. Yes. So yes. someone recognized that. Did they, did they come to you with exactly what to do or did you have to help them kind of craft what needed to be done? Did they say, Hey, this is because again, as a, cause instruction guys, sometimes the government will say, well, here's a conceptual, but come to us with the actual final plan. Was that kind of how it went or did you, did they know exactly what they wanted? Um, they didn't know. They never know exactly what I know that. That's. <laughs> I guess that was kind of a softball question. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they thought they knew. We said right. oh, we kind of want maybe this. Um, the, they know what they funny. wanted it to do. They wanted the outcome. They knew the outcome. Yes. Okay. They wanted to do something with. Well, the impetus was they had to move. They were moving offices. Ah. And they needed to do something with all this paper. Ah. And okay. They, they figured the best thing was to inventory it, but they didn't realize, oh, we can do this searchable Excel, searchable inventory right. in Excel so they could all use it and that we could hyperlink PDFs of all the documents. And then I hired high school interns, gave them summer jobs to stand at the scanner. Mm. <laughs> That's that's actually a good question because I was going to ask you how did you pull that off, but um... yeah, yeah, to summer interns, and then you know we we did to have to do the keywords. We needed somebody who knew a little more right. about it, but our interns were learning, and they weren't necessarily science majors. So um, it's funny. One of the interns was my daughter, and and she jokes about knowing what PCBs means, and she's like not a scientist <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool that's pretty cool you know let's let's so let's stick with that theme when you were starting out like how did you build your team you know it's interesting the first the first contract that i brought in came with people so um it was a it was a help desk okay. and the woman who was operating the help desk, we won the, we, we were awarded the contract work. And so it made sense. I'm going to hire her because she knows what she's doing. I don't. Right. Um, and so then I worked alongside of her. I figured I should know what's going on. So I sat next to her and she taught me what was going on. And then as time went on um, and I needed to do new hires because it grew, I realized it wasn't a, it wasn't just a clerical job. We needed someone who understood a little bit of the environmental science. Okay. So my next hires, I was hiring people right out of school with environmental science degrees. Okay. And then, and we actually still have that work and we use it to bring in our entry level people. It's where we start them to just try it out. We, we always tell them it's the most boring job. It's, it's not glamorous but stick it out, you know, and, and we test them to see if they can learn and quickly grasp some of the concepts. And then from there, we start assigning them into other projects. Okay. Okay. No, that's pretty neat. How do you, um, 
decide, right? I'm sure at the beginning, you probably took whatever projects fit. <laughs> that were, you, yeah. know? <laughs> you probably took everything and had like, okay, this, this counts for, you know, environmental science. <laughs> yeah, there was some, there was a call. I, I was in the 8A program. And oh, I didn't know that. Okay, you were 8A yeah. program. Okay. We when What year, from when to when? 20 2004 to 2013 okay okay all right so, and then around 2000 it was 2005 I got a call and they said oh you're 8a I said, yeah he says you're Native American yeah he says we've got a contract that we want to um, sole source for remediation on Indian land out in out of out of the Denver EPA office and I said and I still remember this i was driving to the office and i remember saying yeah yeah we can do that and i remember hanging up going oh crap how are we going to do that <laughs> <laughs> and it took them two years to actually award the work but in those two years i had found um, a guy in denver who um, did remediation and I had worked with someone previously who I knew was a great program manager and I had wanted to hire him over. So I was grooming him to bring on. So I had a lot of lead time to find people. But but yeah, there are very few times I've said, no, mm, we're not interested. I, I have said, no, we don't do that. You right. know, there have been things that they ask us to come in like to remediate asbestos well we don't go in and actually do asbestos removal right, and i right. don't have any desire to so those kinds of things i can say no but but if it's close yeah we're gonna figure out a way to to do it okay all right now before we got started and that's interesting i didn't know that you were 8a um i did read that because it says uh, avanti corporation is a native american woman-owned firm providing earth protection services yes i like that <laughs> I like that. I like that. They told um, me I needed to rebrand. They didn't like it, but we left it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, I I like that. I mean, regulatory development, implementation, compliance, uh, smart growth support, environmental data management, compliance, audits, inspections, guidance, training, development, and outreach. And I skipped the word I couldn't pronounce. So, <laughs> NEPA, NEPA, uh, NEPA. NEPA is a, it's the National Environmental Policy Act. Okay. And that's where you, if you have to write an environmental impact statement, it all falls under that regulation. Okay. All right. All right. Nice. Uh, no, that's fascinating. Now we know we keep mentioning the EPA. Are, are there any other agencies that you support? Yeah, we've had contracts with um, EPA since our start. Sure. Um, we've also worked at NOAA. Okay. Um, and we are currently working at Department of Interior, so the Bureau of Ocean. Um, energy management. Okay. So, so anything that's either offshore wind, oil and gas, geophysical, tidal, anything, anything in the waters off the U.S. minerals mining that falls under that office. Um, and we um, right at the beginning of COVID won a contract with um, NIH. Okay. And so it's the um, National Institute of Environmental Health Studies or mm. science. Um, so it's it's where they look at um, health and environment and where they in, intersect. You know, whereas NIH, you think of typically the the Bethesda work, but this right. is this is this is their other branch. Have you always ser serviced like federal clients, uh, or is that something new? Always been in federal. It's just it's what I it's what I know. So okay. it's where I've always been. We're we're trying to get into um, commercial and state work. Um, I just made a, a strategic hire two weeks ago, and she has a lot more contacts in that realm. And okay. so we'll go that way, just to diversify. Sure. No. no. And it makes sense because you're you're in Virginia, uh, and so you grew up in the area, and so it makes sense to to attack the federal marketplace. Um, yeah. It's yeah. My first job was with a federal contractor. So I know how that works. And, you know, a lot of people, they want to break into the other, but it's, it's just hard and they have to know you. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, now I, I saw that you, um, like I said, you worked at 
a couple of companies beforehand and then you came on to Avanti. Right. And then you worked there 10 years and then you took over as present CEO. So how did that happen? Well, there's a story. <laughs> I want to hear the story. We would no, love I stories. Like I like the so, stories. Okay. So Avanti started when um, I was working for um, a company right out of college and I'd been there almost five years and the president of the company died and his wife took over and she just didn't really want the environmental division anymore. She kind of made it a bit hostile for us to stay. So we kind of scattered like you know, rats off a ship and everybody was looking for jobs. And the vice president of that division said he was starting his own company. Would I come on? And so we walked out of that door on a Friday and Avanti was started on Monday. Mm. Um, six years later, that VP who started the company and I got married. So then we had um, we had the company. We we were a small business for a while and it just wasn't growing. We had a contract that the government converted to the government employees. So we lost a bunch of people. It just was looking shaky. So we merged with another company by selling our contracts mm. and it didn't go very well. Um, so after a little over a year with that merger, um, we had the corporate divorce <laughs> and, and we went back to Avanti. We took our contracts and worked back with us. And so my husband and I were working the two of us with a couple of other part-time senior people we had worked with and we were kind of burned out on government contracting and really just not enjoying it anymore. So he decided to go do something else completely. And I was doing some program management for somebody I knew as part-time and some, a, another acquaintance approached me about buying Avanti. And because he wanted to start an 8A company and you have to be in business two years. And he thought he could buy an established company and short track mm -hmm. that. So I was trying to figure out whether I was going to team with him, co-partner with him, co-own with him. Um, and I talked to a, a corporate attorney and she says, well, you know, you qualify for 8A yourself. And that's when I said, oh, okay, deal's off, done. I'm, I'm going to do this. <laughs> Jumped in, got my A day certificate in um, 60 days, if you can believe that. No. Yeah. Incredible. So, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, I wasn't ready because I'm it's like, no, 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 I don't want to start yet. I was, you know, working on business plans and, and deals and trying to get stuff started. Um, but no, clock started ticking. You're in. So go. <laughs> Wow. So that that's where it all that's where it happened. Interesting. So you're the Native American. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I know. It's not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a descendant. My mother is in my mother's Ojibwe and she is um a member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe um at a Grand Portage. And they changed the blood quantum laws for the tribe between my older brother and my birthdays. So my brother is in the tribe as well. I'm not in the tribe, but as a descendant of the tribe, SBA recognizes me as minority. Sure. So we're gone. Well, the minority owned part is your woman. It's minority owned, but the, the native American is yeah. the, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, but the native American part. Huh? Nice. So your brother's in the tribe. Is he older or younger? older okay so that's yeah, so he got in like at a cutoff date I, okay yes, so he passed a cutoff date and then he, yeah he and then my younger brother and i no no <laughs> not interesting oh yeah well did they see any pictures at least <laughs> did your older brother see any pictures a bit of a sore subject because they always tell me about their checks oh uh, okay yeah that's okay we won't touch on that no more yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> Yeah, don't well, talk about how you spend your money. <laughs> right? Well, that's okay. You know, I, I, I'm i sure that you've had, a, like you said, um, 
I, first of all, thank you for that story. That was great. Uh, you know, because again, that kind of connects the dots for me. Uh, I was warning about that only because the way it was listed on your profile. Right. So I was kind of right. curious. Yeah. It, it looks like you work for the company and you took over, which most people do. They take over uh, after having been there for so many years. They're like the next, like the part of the succession plan. Um, yeah, my husband decided he wanted to go off and do something else. And I said, and we had a couple small contracts. I said, well, let's just make it woman owned and see if that does anything. And that was before I had really done anything for sure. marketing company, yeah. but we had done the stock shares change and, and, um, you know, we reestablished everything so that when I went to get certified, you know, when they finally kicked in the woman owned program, um, and I went to get certified. Everything was all in order. Good, good stuff. Um, as he, and they interview you. They want to make sure you're in charge. Sure. And they made sure that he was available by telephone immediately, so that we couldn't talk and share any kind of corroboration. Right, right. And Whatever. and I'm sure you probably appreciate that, right? I do, because there there are women out there who are the front for right. their husband companies. Right. Right. So yeah, I'm fine with it. I, yeah. But. Yeah. Nothing to hide. Uh, what about your husband? Is he still working at the other place where he's still, is he supporting Avanti today? Um, he, he is still, he's still <laughs> on the board because our tax accountant wants him to stay there because he had some tax losses to, to okay. <laughs> from when he was running the company. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's still on, he's still a minority shareholder. He's pretty much retired. Okay. That's nice. Uh, yeah. I drag him in to help with things when needed. His resume is still very impressive. So we use it in proposals, um, kind of as a senior reviewer. Um, he's a PhD biochemist. Um, ah. He also did a lot of the offshore work that the company started with. So, okay. Okay. Uh, nice. No. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm sure it helps uh, his, his experience of his years and working, I'm sure that you could, anyone who would not want to be able to lean on that, especially in your line of work. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and we joke that we learned to work together before we were married. So when we're at work, we're, we can talk work, you know, okay. Properly. I was going to add, that was my next Great. question. You got it. You, you're still in my questions. That's okay. How's yeah. it? How do you handle that? Right. Yeah. Like he, one time, oh, probably more than one time he said, God, my boss was such a, and today, and I saw you just need to vent about your boss. And he goes, yeah, oh, I couldn't believe what she was asking me to do. Wow. Maybe she was thinking this. <laughs> that's, uh, I, I like that. That's pretty good. No, yeah. I mean, that's, that's good that you've been able to work through that. But like you said, you worked together first before, um, you know, you actually got married. Yeah. So. And I know a lot of husbands and wives who work together and, and it's, it's different for every one of them. Right. It's, depends on how you started and what the roles are and who's in charge of what, but yeah, okay. he, he doesn't come to the office. He really, you know, I can tell him about things he isn't interested, but he's pretty much um, retired. So what is he doing his retirement? Shoot. Um, it's really <laughs> recent that he's fully retired. So okay, I mean, so he's still been him. okay. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's the perfect husband for busy CEO. He does the the grocery shopping and the cooking. Okay, and the running around, and so. You know, okay, listen, good. listen. So I need to find me a busy CEO wife because I I like grocery shopping and cooking and. <laughs> There you go. There you go. You know, you know, I, right? <laughs> that sounds like a good situation. I like that. Yeah. I mean, it really worked out well when I was first starting the company, you know, to build it up after getting the 8A, my daughter was just going into elementary school and I could do all the school volunteer stuff and, you know, still switch back and forth. And that's part of why the company isn't striving to be humongous. I understand work-life balance. I understand right. that I'm not trying to be something where you've got to work 10 hour days. I, I have worked many snack bars and booster programs and everything else is. So I get it when you want to go do those things with your kids. Right. You know, we, we provide that flexibility because we don't demand 
that you know you must bring in x dollars or anything like that we right. don't have that culture right um, oh wow well. well that and that and i i think that a lot of people listening to this um you know those are typically some of the questions that we ask but i think there's a lot more people out there like you that saying hey you know there's more than one pathway to success in business and happiness and fulfillment, self-actualization, all those things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs that it doesn't require, you know, 12 hour days and, you know, right. weekends. Once my, and, well, once my daughter went off to college, then I felt, okay, now I can put more time into the business. I didn't have PTAs and school renovations and, you know, all those other crusades I was on. <laughs> I could put all that energy into okay. the company um, and only recently realized, okay, I need another outlet. You know, what's my other cause? I have to be always tilting at windmills. So, um, so I've found some volunteer work that is okay. You know, you want to share any what are you, what you're working on? Any of the, vol the volunteer stuff? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I I um, environmental science. So it, it I realized like I drive by my camp community park, and okay. um, the these invasive vines are killing the trees, uh, and I I just one day went up there and started cutting them <laughs> and, I, and thought probably not supposed to do this on park property right with permission right so then i went down the rabbit hole trying to find how do you get permission and ended up volunteering and now i am the invasive management um area coordinator <laughs> did they even and, have an invasive management coordinator before you uh no well this park didn't they they get volunteers for each park the okay county park system has it what's um what's kind of funny is right before we got on this call i got an email saying i'm hosting 40 people <laughs> to come out and help me um, next friday so i guess i'm taking friday off and um they're going to help me tear out vines and rip up roots so we're going to get on it so it won't just be me but yeah it's like you got to find something outside of work uh, i agree i agree no um this is this is like my hobby you know, <laughs> I I love meeting new people and exciting people in the space and then sharing their stories and their journeys. And I get so much positive feedback from it. Right. You know, uh, I'm not paid to do it. And people love hearing the stories. And so I, I, I love meeting with new people. And this gives me a way to connect with folks across the country that I never would have a chance to talk about and learn and meet and experience. And at the same time, showcase your story. So do not let us leave without saying something that, that you want to get off your chest <laughs> or, you know, don't let us leave. But I was, you know, saying some things that you definitely want to come on and say to a national audience. Okay. Just keep that okay. whirling. All right. Let's, let's change up the subject because we, you know, we're coming down to our last 20 minutes here. A recent purchase that you made on Amazon that brought you joy. Joy. Well, I mean, because I used to say recent purchase, but if you well, didn't like it, that's not an account, right? Like it was like, oh, this this isn't what I expected. No, but you can tell whatever well, recent purchase. This, this is pretty random. So yesterday I purchased uh -huh. um, uh, a stand that holds your laptop up high. Okay. Um, because my COO is always done at his desk like this. And um, so I bought one for him and my husband is same thing down like this. And so I, I, turning in the uh, expense report. And I joked to um, the office manager. I said, I just bought two of these, one for my work husband and one for my husband. And because they're both just so hunched over on their computers uh -huh. and it will be a surprise. Like, ooh, the gift. There um, you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. So, I, I have one of those. Yeah. yeah. And it's light and you it folds flat and you can put it and you can carry it with you. So. All right. Different. No, that's, that's good. That be the most recent thing. That's okay. They appreciate that. Uh, tell me something about your business that when you first started, that's hard, that's still difficult. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, for me, what's still hard is, um, well, there's a couple things. One is my, just being confident and being a business owner and, okay. and owning it. Um, I've just always had self-doubt that I, you know, I have waves of getting over it and waves of going under it. So 
um, you know, I can be very easily intimidated by mm. other business owners who um, I'm sure they know more than me. You know, right, know. right, so, right, right. So I would say that's the hard thing is just owning up to that. Yeah, I've done this long enough. I probably know what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, I, I, based on what I've seen, okay. Do you have any idea of how many reports you've produced? Oh God, no. Um, Thousands. Hundreds at least. Yeah. Um, right. So I think that's qualify you. <laughs> no, but I get, I get it. And I agree. Um, and that's great. And I love that expressive vulnerability because I think that, you know, we as small businesses, we do often have self-doubt, right. And, um, I think it's great that you can share that because these are things that we don't talk about enough, right? Uh, were there any things along your journey or your path where like any books that you read or any materials that helped you to increase your knowledge of what it takes to be a business owner? Oh, I am always, always um, listening to audio books. I find, I find business books to be better as audio books for me. Um, I joke that squirrels in our local park are the most business savvy because I'm always listening to my book out loud while I walk the dog. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I'm always, always um, reading um, something recently. It was, I had an Enneagram done and it's just a self-evaluation um, that it's, it's part, you know, it's like a Myers-Briggs kind of thing. I, okay. I'm, I'm all about those tests. I love Strengths Finders. That when I give that book to every employee. What's it called? Strengths Finders. Okay. Uh, I really like that one because instead of looking for your weaknesses, it actually looks for your strengths. And then it tells you how to use those strengths. And then for everybody else, you can look at, the people on your team and see, okay, this person's really good at analysis. This person is good at um, fact finding. This person is good. Of course, I'm uh, the outlier to the company, the rest of everybody. I'm the activator. I'm the one that I don't need every fact and figure all the way to the end. I'm going to make a decision. We're going to start moving. We can change our minds on the way. So I'm the one to walk in a meeting and say, all right, enough, let's go. You know, let's let's get it going. But the Enneagram that I just had done was interesting because the the results I've been told I was intimidating in the office as a boss. And I'm like, how could I be intimidating? I'm just like goofy and Yeah. So so no ego, nothing. But oh but the Enneagram came back and said, I walk into a room with such confidence, it's intimidating. So here I am thinking, I have no self-confidence, but I'm intimidating people with my entrance in a room with my confidence. So I'm always learning because I got to figure that one out. Um, you know, meeting again with the person who does the evaluation. Okay. No, <laughs> like that's, that a, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, no, yeah, so much. Yeah, someone said people have said I'm intimidating and I feel like I have the same personality as you kind of goofy and we're laughing and having a good time and but like you said maybe you're right maybe it's your aura the presence that you it's, yeah apparently my confidence like which I didn't think was a problem. threat I don't think I thought it was a problem I thought it would be a, a, I would think that you want a confidence person to be your leader that's leading the charge yeah someone that was more that was someone that was self-assured I would that's what I would think but I could, again, I'm not the psychologist. I didn't do the Enneagram. I don't. I, well, I'll follow up with you when I get more information. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cause I'm just curious. No, I was, I've been told that. Cause I said, why did you not do it? I said, well, they're a little bit intimidated by you. About me. Right, I right. ask for help all the time. I said, look, I, I'm, I said the same thing. I go, listen, I don't know everything. I, I, I don't know. And even today I don't admit I'm the best podcaster but I do know government contracting and I have a passion and I want to help educate people. Yeah. That's it. So that's, that's, but, that's yeah. my why, you know? Uh, but do I think there's other people that podcast better? Sure. They probably ask better questions. Absolutely. Uh, they're better at YouTubing than me, but I do have, a, 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 I'm very interested and I'm curious and 
So I carry that with me. And also, I am also experiencing all of these programs so I can relate to them. Right. So, right. And that's what I, I lead with. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I lead with. So, uh, yeah. You know, so, oh, that's interesting. Uh, if, and this is kind of a hard question. Uh, tell me, uh, it's, well, because I normally ask people, if you weren't doing this, what do you think you'd be doing? What other job? But you've been doing it so long. I don't even know if you have that in mind, another job that you could would do. You know, it's funny that people have asked, well, what do you, you know, when will you retire? What will you do? When are you going to you know, sell the company? Go on. I said, well, everybody I've met who wants to sell their company and then goes through with it is because they're going to something. Like I'm selling the company because I'm going to start this nonprofit or right, this, whatever right. it is. And so I waffle with that so much. I realize it's because I don't know what I want to go to. Right. Um, you know, that, so yeah, the answer is, I don't know. I've, you know, I've always had this weird fantasy of being a big, um, heavy equipment operator. I just think that's so cool. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's a good, idea. I like that. Okay. You know, just the, the big backhoe. I just think that'd be awesome. But, um, I think somehow it, it's going to involve, um, plants, gardening, environment, um, sustainability. So it's going to be somewhere in that realm and it'll probably be, um, volunteering. You know, I always joked, I'm going to retire and save wine or save puppies and drink wine. And, um, you know, and then I realized, nah, the, you know, that's not enough. Um, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna need to have something. So I like, I like heavy equipment operator. Yeah. If we if if we don't put back trade schools, we're gonna need you anyway. So <laughs> we're gonna be calling you up for duty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. I just saw yesterday the community college has a um cat simulator, so you can sit and learn how to do it. So okay. All right. yeah. All right. All right. I'm I'm rooting for you. <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Uh, do you do uh, any type of annual reflection in your business? Where you take back and you look at what you, you no, know, do you set up like and say, hey, this is what we want to accomplish this year or anything like along those lines? I I just started doing that. I guess so this year I I set out my big picture vision. And this okay. was a result of a mentor that I had have been working with. And I and and he convinced me that yeah, if you're not if you don't know where you're going, how to how does your staff know where you're going? Right. And so I did um, sit and reflect and and created the big picture vision of where you know I wrote it as in December 2023. Here's where Avanti is. Here's okay. what we're doing. Um, and and that was very useful. I just have built out my management team, and I now have people that I think are thinking strategic in the right positions. And I, so I see that this will be something that next year it will be done as a group exercise. You know, we'll revisit it. What's going to be our goals for the year and how are we going to measure success? So it, I'll be bringing the team in on that after this first exercise. So you mentioned you have a mentor. Where did you find your mentor? I've had several and okay. I, I've outgrown some. One that I was working with was part of a larger um, program, and I just, I think as of tomorrow, whatever, yeah, tomorrow's date, I will not be a member of that any longer, so I'm kind of in search of a new mentor. Um, okay. I have a mastermind group that I'm part of, Okay. and that was through um, Women Presidents Organization. And so my WPO chapter is a bunch of women CEOs from the Northern Virginia area. And that's a group, you know, we're on text chat constantly. I'm leaving here to go to lunch with them. And, you know, it's anything can, is, is open to, to everyone. Is it family? Is it your home life? You know, what car are you buying? But everything about business is, is open for discussion. And we constantly are using each other's experience so it's it's not so much a mentor but a mastermind um sure. and several of those ladies have had different coaches so i'm i'm deciding whether what kind of coach i need next 
And it's called Women's President's Organization? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's and international. Said, it's, okay. it's, yeah. And it's, and it's women CEOs? Which, yes. Okay. Okay. No, that's good because uh, people are always asking me about other organizations to join, which again, I know the ones that cater to the federal arena, but these are great to have other ones like that are not that are not specific to federal contracting because I do believe in shared experiences. So that's great that they can bring yeah. a different uh, experience to the table. And then you offer your own sets of experiences that you've had. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I and I, I truly believe you have to find your tribe, whatever business you're in. And I have my WPO group as one support. Um, and that provides, you know, for, it can be emotional. It can be how to fire somebody, how to hire somebody, you know, give me the name of your CFO kind of thing. Um, and then on the other side, I'm a member of WIP, Women Impacting yep. Public Policy. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm uh, actually right now, I'm the um, chair of the Leadership Advisory Committee Council. And um, that, though, I see as more of the we have issues that we need to get in front of our legislators. It's more of, you know, get getting what's due to small and women-owned businesses. Sure. So it's a very different group. Um, right. Some of you think, same thing, amazing ladies that I can go to all business owners and I can go to them with questions and, you know, referrals, um, but, but kind of in different arenas. No, no, I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm promising. I'm going to put this in my Slack group as soon as we get off the call. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got a couple of women leaders that I need to help um, them be part of these sort of organizations to be built up. So. Yeah. If you're a woman in government contracting with a with your own firm, you got to be a member with because there's just so much valuable information. Everybody there is is helping everybody else. We're all in the same, you know, same boat, same team. I love it. I love it. So um, do you see yourself retiring? ever <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna ask the same questions they asked you uh, um yeah eventually okay. i think i think the it's gonna have to be gradual um i i think my the way i can wrap my head around it now is that i will um be absent a little more um, okay. like we, we right my husband have a trip plan for a month next year okay so that'll be a big test to see how much i'm you know check out or if i'm on my laptop so. right no that's fair that's a good test that's a good way to slowly kind of integrate it and, and experience yeah. that so, yeah. that's good is there any quotes or sayings that you operate by or that you've used in the past that, that kind of stick to your mind let me read the ones on my board here um so one is um i i was I did receive a an award last year, I guess that was. Um and in the presentation it it was I I you know immediately was writing it down the 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 person who was overseeing the ceremony and talking to a bunch of us ladies who were all being recognized and he said that um you know you're all here because you are you're turn your success what is it turning your success into significance. And I thought that's that's something to live by. It's not up to you to just go succeed in on your own. Part of my driving force is that we're all part of this planet and we're all interconnected. Everything is interconnected. So for me to succeed, everyone has to succeed. My 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 driving word is fair. The world needs to be fair. And that means everybody should, you know, just simple things, have food, water, housing. Right. Um, so for me to succeed, I need to impact other people's lives and make the world better. You know, right. however, however little, if it's just saving some trees in my park, or if it's um, creating meaningful regulations that stop the dumping of oil and gas wastes in coastal Louisiana, you know, it's, it, it's got to be, it's got to have meaning. You can't Absolutely. just go to work and have meaning. Um, but um, the other one that I, I have 
in on my board is uh if one loves nature one finds beauty everywhere and i like that that's an instant mango so um i try to try to embody that no i i think that's great and then why don't we uh close out some parting words for small businesses and how someone can recreate your level of success and just leave leave them with some parting words um yeah i say it takes it takes a lot of fortitude to 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 weather the lows because in government contracting the lows are many and the highs are really high um you know you win a contract and it's fabulous but then you you lose more than you win um and and i think that going back to what i said earlier is find your drive um find people who are like minded and and just get to know them and help. when what i really like in wpo is when we mastermind and we 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 work through an issue we don't say you should do this right we say here's my experience right. and then by, and by talking to people with in every kind of business that there is you learn something. It doesn't matter if they're in your industry, you still learn something. Um, I did the Goldman Sachs program and I thought, how am I going to learn from someone who builds teardrop trailers and a gov you know, a general contractor and someone who sells flooring? But absolutely, you, you open your mind and as you're helping them, you're helping yourself. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's a tough community, but everybody in it is pretty much out there to help each other. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. No, I, I would agree with that. Well, Lynn, listen, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Uh, I would definitely want to make sure you get off to lunch with your mastermind group today. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be courteous to you, respectful and mindful of your time. So, so thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story on the GovCon Giants podcast. Great. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. Take care now. You too. Bye-bye.